Hey, Mitch. Yeah. All right. We should get started. All right. Let's get the meeting started. It's uh, 730. So welcome everyone to the uh, July 2022 meeting of the Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers. Uh, my name is Jeremy Carlo, or I guess I'm the Alexander Haig for the evening, because uh, our uh, president is in quarantine right now and our vice president is away on business. So uh, I'll be running uh, this evening's meeting. So we are uh, live streaming on YouTube. I see we've got actually 16 people uh, over there. So we've actually got uh, almost as many people watching online as we have uh, in the room. So I'm glad that everyone can be here. All right, let me uh, turn this out of here. I'm not sure why this insists on being here. It should disappear. the lights uh yeah maybe we can lower the lights uh, not sure why the screen share thing keeps appearing up there but uh i wish we could get rid of that it was gone just a minute ago all right we're trying to figure out all of these technical issues here I'll get rid of as much as I can. All right, so as you know, and it's blocking all of my pictures here. All right, so. If you say you were sharing, I think you drag it. This thing, move it. All right, let's get this out of the way. There we go, thanks. That's why we need tech support. All right, now everyone can see what's going on. Those of you watching online probably have no idea what was happening here, but uh, we had a bunch of uh, useless stuff that appeared on the screen. So the Webb telescope is uh, in orbit now, or not in orbit, it's at, it's at L2, we're orbiting around L2. So this week they released uh, some of the first uh, set of pictures. Uh, this is one of my favorite objects, uh, Stefan's Quintet. And my knowledge of it is you look at it and like maybe there's a little bit of a fuzzy spot in the eyepiece. And maybe if you're lucky, maybe you could see a couple of fuzzy spots. Uh, that's what Webb sees. Hmm. That's the Carina Nebula, NGC 3324. That's uh, pretty far south. Saw that once from uh, the uh, winter star party, but not visible from here. Uh, the Southern Ring, that's in Vela, NGC 3132, also known as the Eight Burst uh, Nebula. Also saw that one in the south. It's a little too far down for us. It's like negative 45 declination. So if you really want to get down in the mud, you can see that. Uh, the web also imaged uh, Jupiter, and you can see uh, Europa on the left there. I guess they had to block it out. And I thought this was interesting. This is a comparison of the same field between uh, Webb and Hubble. So the uh, Webb image is the good looking one. That took about 12 hours. And the Hubble one was about two weeks of exposures. So you can really see the difference there. A whole bunch of galaxies, and in fact, most of them are being lensed by the foreground galaxy. So probably the brighter ones that you see there are in the foreground. And then those really uh, dim ones in the background, they're all being lensed and light is all being uh, bent around like that. Just a comparison of the capabilities. Uh, the web is a false color image. The web is mostly sensitive in infrared. So if you read kind of that long message that I posted to the group uh, last week, I was explaining that, you know, the web isn't really the replacement for Hubble. It's a companion, it's a successor, it's an accessory to it. Uh, the Hubble still is unique in that it can observe in the ultraviolet, which you can't do with uh, Webb. Uh, most of the real big science that they want to do with Webb, so the distant galaxies, young stars, exoplanets, that stuff all screams infrared. But there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do with the blue and ultraviolet light. And especially the ultraviolet right now, Hubble is the only game in town. Uh, Webb is also limited because of that sun shield. It can only reach about a third of the sky at any given time, whereas Hubble goes around the Earth, so you just wait 90 minutes 
and you can get most of the sky other than a little area around the sun. So pray to whatever gods you want that Hubble keeps running as long as possible. Uh, pray that those gyros hold out and those uh, detectors uh, keep running for at least another five to 10 years because the next ultraviolet mission isn't going up until at least 2039. And that's what NASA is claiming. So we know how likely that is. All right, so some upcoming events. Uh, this will be kind of a short business meeting uh, tonight. Uh, there will be a first light uh, for the Webb Telescope event. It'll be hosted at Penn State Abington by my friend, uh, uh, be hosted by Ann Schmiedekamp and collaborators over at uh, Penn State Abington. That'll be on Sunday, July 24th at 2 p.m. And if you want to find more information about it or to register, go to that link right there. Uh, coming up at the new moon period at the end of this month, we have the Cellophane Convention up in Springfield, uh, Vermont. That'll be the weekend of July 28th to 31st. Uh, that's the famous uh, pink clubhouse you can see. And I believe that was a photo from 2021. Uh, the Astronomical League Convention is taking place that same weekend in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, so you can register for that if you want to go. Uh, the next uh, public star party at Valley Forge. That will be on August 6th. That will be between 8 and 11 p.m. So come on out for that. Uh, last month, I know we had a pretty uh, poor turnout of telescopes. I think the weather changed just the last second, and everybody thought it was going to be clouded out. But hopefully, we'll have better weather uh, for next time. We do have a couple of new members. We have uh, Utkarsh Singh of uh, Audubon, Richard Torrance of Philadelphia, and Alap Verma of Philadelphia. I know at least one of you is here tonight. Is anyone else here? All right, let's welcome. Is anyone here for the first time or for the first time in a while? All right, welcome. Welcome to all first timers. Hopefully we'll see you again uh, at the next meeting. Yeah. Um, uh, were there any uh, glitches in the web, uh, uh, like, Remember the Hubble had the lens problem that they had to go up and fix. Uh, any uh, glitches in the uh, Webb's uh, spectrography? Uh, so the question is, any glitches along the way? As far as I know, there haven't been any. So it's like miraculous and like millions of parts, everything worked. So yeah, that, that was the thing we were all worried about. When the first picture came back, it would be blurry. <laughs> that didn't happen. And, and so. why did it have to take so long to uh, produce pictures to come out? The question was, why did it take so long for the pictures to come out? Well, it took a month or so to get out to that uh, position. That's a million miles from the Earth. But then, remember, you see the pictures that had to unfold, and all the mirrors had to co-align. So there was a whole lot of stuff that had to happen. But it took several months after that to actually get these shots. Yeah, so that, I mean, that, that process does take a couple of months. It had to cool down, too. Uh, that's true. The detectors have to cool down to be sensitive in the infrared. So there's you had to deploy the sun shield and just wait for it to radiate. There's a lot of there's a, yeah, initializing a satellite is quite a job. Yeah. It, 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 one or two is not done. And Brian has worked on satellites, so he's uh, all right. Uh, the next uh, DVAA monthly meeting is going to be on August 19th. That's a little bit later than usual. We had to do that so that we could uh, uh, reserve the site. And it's going to be at Fort Washington State Park. Uh, we did this last year. I thought it was pretty nice. Uh, this is called Take Your Observing to the Next Level. So from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, we'll have some exhibits. And then weather permitting, they'll be observing afterwards. Uh, there is a nice covered pavilion. So even if the weather isn't the greatest, uh, you'll be protected from it. So this will be free. It'll be open to members of the public or, or the public and to uh, DVAA members. Uh, we are recommending registration. I don't know if you have to do that, but uh, that is being recommended. So a couple of the exhibits we'll have, there'll be solar observing and photography, uh, the 2024 eclipse, observing equipment, uh, astro imaging, large Dobsonians, uh, Celestron, gizmos and gadgets. And I know we are looking for some additional uh, exhibits. So if you're interested in that, uh, contact uh, Jan Rush, who's organizing uh, this meeting. All right, so some reports from uh, committees. Uh, Lou from uh, Astrophotography, uh, they had a meeting on Wednesday night, it was held on Zoom. And Lou told me they're working on getting the recording up on YouTube, hopefully sometime uh, next week. 
I don't think we have any updates on main sequence star parties. All right, door prizes, uh, nothing for that. Uh, light pollution, uh, Barry, did you want to uh, report? Well, we Maybe have... get up here because they can hear you oh, better. Okay. My toupee on straight. <laughs> Where should I stand for the microphone? Right the computer. Okay, uh, for the uh, uh, light pollution abatement committee, we made a, we were invited to uh, make presentations at the uh, Rutgers Planning and Zoning Conference that was held at the uh, Crown Plaza Hotel in uh, Plainsboro, New Jersey. And uh, we presented our light pollution abatement PowerPoints uh, to two groups of uh, municipal officials in New Jersey. Uh, so it won't help us out that much here, but uh, to New Jersey public officials, including zoning, uh, officers, code enforcement, uh, supervisors, et cetera, planning commission, uh, what am I forgetting? Zoning hearing board, uh, officials in New, New Jersey townships. And we had about 35 people for two one hour sessions. So it's educating the public about light pollution. And so that was uh, this year on June 10th. All right, thanks very much. Uh, Barry's doing a great job uh, spreading the word about light pollution. <clears throat> Right, uh, newsletter. Hopefully, uh, most of you are reading the newsletter every month. Has anyone uh, read the newsletter? All right. Yeah, it's uh, pretty good. We have a committee running it now, and I think that makes the work a lot easier. You know, as they say, uh, many hands make light work. So I remember doing that 12 newsletters a year <sighs> after a while. You know, now it's a little more manageable because we're each only doing about two a month or two a year. So we can really uh, put a lot of effort into it. And I think the quality of the uh, product has gone up a lot. So it's, it's really a great newsletter. You should uh, check it out. And we also have old copies uh, on the website as well. Who's the longest? I am. So the best editor. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, outreach. I know we did have a couple of events uh, recently, and we do have an upcoming event. I don't have any information about that, though. Uh, if anyone online uh, has any questions, you can type them into the YouTube uh, chat and uh, John will be there to uh, relay them back. Uh, publicity, I don't have anything uh, updated on that. Uh, scope rentals, we do have a number of uh, scope rentals available. I'm not sure I don't see Joe out there. But, uh, yeah, you can find out information about scope rentals. You can actually find information about everything at our website, uh, www.dvaa.org. Uh, does anyone else have any committee presentations, any business? Yeah, Barry. Uh, <clears throat> anyone's here for the first time tonight, we'd like to meet them. So uh, after the meeting, why stick around and you'd like. And okay. We'll chat. All right. <clears throat> Sounds good. All right. So observing. Andrew, your turn. your presentation here. Move that over here. All right, here's the little All right. slide advancer. I think. All right, there we go. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Hitchner. I'm the observing chair for the DVAA. Uh, and this is the observing report for July 2022. And uh, before I get into this, I do want to like kind of go off what Jeremy was saying, how, you know, the James Webb telescope, very impressive. I don't think anybody thinks, doesn't think so. But it really only looks in the infrared. It looks from short wave infrared to the long wave infrared. And from a sensor standpoint, you know, you use different, or you use different materials to, to handle that, you know, from Mercatel to gallium arsenide. But you kind of just like stitch it together. And like the, the thought about how you do that is the same. The way Hubble does ultraviolet all the way to shortwave infrared is just astounding to me from a sensor technology standpoint, because the way that you think about imaging each one of those regimes is completely different from each other. So I hope Hubble still yeah, kicks off, kicks around. There's a lot of science that Hubble can do, um, but I'm going to enjoy looking at the James Webb telescope pictures anyway. So, all right. So into the observing report. And uh, this month I wanted to look at Aquila, the eagle. Uh, it 
doesn't get very high in our sky, uh, but you know, two months ago I did uh, Cygnus, last month I did Lyre, so I thought that this would be the logical uh, successor to those, uh, being that the alpha star Altair, um, if there's a thing. Altair right there um, is part of the summer triangle, the big um, asterism in the summer sky. Uh, so a little bit of overview. Um, Aquila is one of the quote unquote oldest constellations. Now what do I mean by oldest? Well, um, I think it was the Sumerians um, who first designated this group of stars as an eagle. And then that kind of just been passed in down through all of the ancient civilizations um, to then us, really. So that's one of the few um, constellations out there that kind of kept its name, the eagle, throughout all of those generations. Um, dates back to 2600 BC. Now it is situated on the celestial equator and um, you can see that it's down here, but I wanted to keep this image, it's down the lower part of the image for those of you online, but I wanted to keep this because it shows the Great Rift, and that's that big dark area in the Milky Way. So if we look at the Summer Triangle here with Deneb, that blue star right in the middle, and then um, Vega off to the right, and then Altair down at the bottom, um, you can see that giant rift in the Milky Way uh, that you know you're in a dark sky location when you can easily um, see that in the sky naked. Now, being in the Milky Way, uh, it's kind of poor in open clusters, which, you know, you kind of associate the Milky Way with the open clusters and then the off Milky Way um, constellations of having globular clusters. Because the globular clusters are older, um, it takes a long time to form, and then the Milky Way has some younger stars on the plane, um, and then they would be in the open clusters. So being the Milky Way constellation, there's um, a poor amount of open clusters. However, um, it is very abundant in planetary nebula, and I'll show a lot of good specimens of that later. And um, being situated to, to the Great Rift, there's also a good amount of dark nebula in the area as well. All right, so here's the star chart. Uh, you can see Altair, the um, alpha star up there. That's about 0.7 magnitude or so. So it's a pretty bright star. Um, you can see this drawn different ways. I've seen just like a big kite connecting the four stars. I like it this way, how you can kind of bring out the wings. Um, to kind of make it seem like, hey, we're not just making things up out here. It actually does look like an eagle. Um, and, but the first thing that you'll notice is there's not a lot of stuff in it, to be honest. Like there's not a lot of, you know, like little yellow circles for clusters. There's not a lot of like, you know, big um, nebula or anything. Uh, so a lot of these objects are going to be on the more like um, intermediate to advanced objects. Uh, a lot of them will be definitely better for a telescope rather than binoculars. Um, but there are some pretty interesting stars also, which I'll talk about, which can obviously be seen uh, with binoculars or telescopes and even the naked eye. Now, one of those stars is Altair. So Altair, you, you know, it, it seems pretty benign, you know, it's just up there. It's a single star system. Uh, it's kind of like bluish white, uh, but it's actually pretty interesting. Altair spins very, very fast. Uh, I put it up there in case anyone wants to know, uh, 290 kilometers per second. Uh, you, how fast is that? I don't know. We don't, we don't go anywhere close to that. Uh, but what's interesting is that it is spinning so fast that it's actually not completely spherical. Um, it is kind of squashed, if you will, along the poles, um, which makes it kind of interesting. You know, why is it spinning so fast? There's a lot of interesting research there. Um, it is also one of the first stars to be directly imaged. Uh, and when I say that, that we have directly imaged the surface of the star, and actually seeing some resolved components like sunspots on the star. You can't see them in this image here, um, but it has been done. And the reason why that is, is because it is one of the closest stars to us, even though it's not the brightest star in the sky, it is pretty close to us. All right, next is our Aquila. And if you know my, con or know my presentations, I really like stars, especially variable stars. So our Aquila is a Myra type pulsating star. So what is that? That means that the star itself is actually changing size. It's pulsating, if you will. And why it's doing that is because it's actually changing in temperature. So when it is smaller in diameter, it's a bit cooler. And then when it's larger in diameter, it's a bit hotter. 
Now that causes the magnitude to go from 5.5 all the way down to magnitude 12 in about 284 days. But it's not really the it's not really the fact that the light is decreasing from the star. What's happening is that as it gets cooler, light is moving from the visible range over here, so about 5,000 Kelvin or so. Well, 5,000 Kelvin is pretty hot for this star. But if you will, for example, 5,000 Kelvin, as you get cooler, you can see that the light moves more into the infrared. So we can't see that light. So it's not really that there's less light coming from the star, it's that the light's just shifting to a regime that we can't see. If you, for instance, put an infrared camera, like something like James Webb Telescope on this, uh, I think you'd find that the actual amount of light coming from the star is relatively <clears throat> constant over that. It's just our eyes that can't see the light as it shifts through its period. It's the All right. Of the cycle. Excuse me? What's the timing of those cycles of, of big and little? 284 days is, the, is going from um, like the brightest point up here to then the brightest point over there. It's about 284 days. So it's not really going to be something that you can directly observe. Uh, you'd have to keep going back to it um, over the course of the year, really, to, to see any difference. So, um, And then I just put up here for reference, this is from our friends at AAVSL. Um, a lot of these, again, measurements are from amateur um, astronomers just like you you can if you're interested in doing this kind of thing you can go there and then it'll tell you all about how to make variable star measurements and then to report them and to actually contribute to uh, to real science being done which is fun all right next we have 23 aquila and um i wish bart was here or maybe he's online uh but this is one of the rare cases where you can see a green star so this is a double star system uh, and it is described as a yellow and green pair. Now, you can't have a green star. They don't exist. If we look at this plot here, and I won't bore you with color science because it bored me in school, but if you look at this right here, this is called the Planckian locus. These are all of the colors that come from a black body. So like when you heat up a metal <coughs> and you go and you keep heating it up, heating it up, heating it up, it will go from you know red to yellow to white to blue. It's the hottest as we observe it with our eyes. <clears throat> green is not on here, okay? Stars can't be green. Stars are essentially black bodies. So how is this star green? Well, there is an optical illusion that if you bring, a, because the primary star is yellow, and then the secondary star is less bright, of course, and it's so close to each other, it's three arc second separation, that secondary star looks green. And that's basically called color fringing. That's just an optical illusion that our eyes create and it is because the primary star is yellow reddish and then that secondary one is so much dimmer. So this is one of the rare cases that you can see a green star um, and I wanted to put it up there because we've been talking about double stars uh, for the last few months or so. I used to hear that Altair was also had a greenish cast at some point. Mm -hmm. I, I realized that the green stars are uh, rare but I had heard that out there was greenish, but okay. your, your description says it's really in the blue. So blue. I would describe out there if we go back, um, definitely as bluer being a type, a type A7 V star. Um, so an A is going to be slightly hotter than our sun, um, and that would lend it to be kind of blue. Now, my theory, though, why it might be green is because, like I've said, um, it doesn't get very high. We talked about this outside, right? It doesn't get very high in the sky. Mm -hmm. And um, that can cause, when we're looking through the atmosphere, and so that can cause a lot of distortion as well. Um, for instance, if you see those pictures of the Milky Way, um, like long exposures, you'll sometimes see a green hue along the atmosphere, along the horizon. Um, and that's just from light being diffracted um, in the sky. So, so that's what I would guess why Alter might sometimes have a greenish hue. Yes, there. The, uh, there's a companion, a small companion star to uh, Antares that's close, that looks green. Uh, it might be another one of these reflexive things, but if you look at uh, 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 Antares, it's not very high in the sky, but with the right conditions and the right telescope, it has a little green a companion that looks green. Okay, yeah. Well, Antares is a good yeah. one, yeah. And that would make sense because Antares is so red. It's a reddish, it's mm -hmm. a red star, but that, it's quite greenish to look at. Okay, yeah, great. 
Yes. You you give it rotation speed kilometers per second. Yeah. yeah. How, how does that translate into radians per second? Circular. Into radians per second? I don't. Revolution. I don't oh, know. Off the top of my head. I think it's like sixteen hours. Sixteen hours. Is that? Very fast. That's pretty fast. Yeah. Um, that's not an arc. That's not a radians per second, but well, kind of gives you a sense. Sixteen hours. Yeah. Okay, so it's sixteen hours of, of it's in reps. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can trade that. Too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that for the for I'll leave that stuff for the orbit analysts so to figure out. <laughs> yes. Does our sun rotate too? Yeah. Uh, our, our sun rotates, but not not this fast. What's the speed of our? I know, Mitch. Do you know you? Yeah, twenty five days at the equator. Twenty five um, days, and that's why okay. when we. You know, when somebody points out sunspots or so, we don't need to immediately go out and look at them that the day of. And we have the opportunity to look and see how the sunspots merge and, and move over time. Whereas if the sunspots aren't out there, you need to get out there really quickly, or you're gonna miss them. So <laughs> but they'll come back around. So take your bet. All right, any other questions? All right, so I think that's my last star. Um, so there are some open clusters in Altair. Uh, this is a pretty nice one, NGC 6709. Uh, if we look at the Trumpler class up there, the three, that's a Roman numeral three, means that um, it's pretty loosely concentrated. Uh, the two means that, the M means that it's medium richness, and then the two means that it's pretty evenly spread out across all stars magnitude wise. So about all the stars are kind of the same magnitude. Uh, if you do do the um, observing the astronomical league program for open clusters, you learn a lot about the Trumpler class, which is pretty interesting. Um, but it's not really a naked eye object. You can see it in binoculars, but you're not going to be able to pick out a lot of stars, uh, maybe the brighter pairs. Uh, but you really need a telescope for this object. Now, you can, though, get away with a pretty modest telescope, four inches or so. Um, but it's going to be best in an eight inch or larger uh, to get a lot of those stars. And you can see from looking at the picture, you kind of have this like triangle um, grouping of stars there. So if you observe it with four inches, you're gonna pick out, um, you're gonna definitely get the sense that it's a triangle or so. Um, you're gonna get some of the brighter stars along the vertices. But if you go eight inches or larger, you're gonna get a lot more stars. It's gonna be a pretty um, rich cluster. So planetary nebula, I mentioned that there's a lot of planetary nebula in Altair, uh, or sorry, in Aquila. I can't really tell you why um, that they're there, uh, but these are pretty challenging objects. Planetary nebula, people think that they can be kind of easy because of the ring nebula. The ring nebula is very distinct. Um, it's really easy to see the ring, uh, but planetary nebula as an object class are pretty difficult. And these are all pretty small. Um, so small that a lot of them you know, if you don't have a really big telescope, um, a lot of them are going to kind of look like stars, to be honest. And a nice trick that I tell people um, is to take an, a filter, uh, either a UHC or O3 filter, and don't put it on the eyepiece. Kind of like get, a, get an eyepiece with a lot of eye relief so that you can move your head away and take that filter and then kind of move it in and out of the field of view. And you'll see the stars just disappear. And then the planetary nebula will still stay there. Because the planetary nebula is emitting a lot of light um, that those filters allow through, but the stars aren't. So that's a great way to kind of, if you think you're in the area and you can't find the planetary nebula, um, then just bust out those filters and really increase that contrast. Um, yeah, but a lot of these are small. Again, I would not go hunting for the center um, star in these. You're probably not gonna see them. Um, eight inch scope minimum. And then probably best in 12 inch plus or so, uh, but very challenging objects and they can be pretty rewarding once you see them. So this guy is um, NGC 6781. Uh, this would be a good one if you did want to see the ring structure because it's pretty, um, pretty pronounced there. There's a lot of concentration of gas along the edges. And then here are some other examples. We have a 6772 up in the top left there. Um, a Bell 70, which is kind of interesting. That reminds me of like the diamond ring effect that you get with like a solar eclipse with that uh, background star kind of right there. Uh, and then down in the bottom right, 6852. And then in the 
um, lower left 6804. Now these are just a handful. Uh, there are probably about a dozen or so. Uh, and if you're doing the astronomical link planetary nebula list, you're gonna be in Aquila quite often. All right, last I wanna talk about dark nebula. And dark nebula, um, I've mentioned it before, but uh, they're kind of overlooked. Uh, but it's basically just a lot of gas that is not allowing the light from the stars in the background to come through. Now, there is a classification of them um, determining like how large they are, how much, how transparent they are. Um, but I didn't mention that here, but there's a lot of them out there. And it probably is no coincidence that there's a lot of dark nebula in the region and also Aquila so, cl so close to the Great Rift. Uh, so, these aren't really imaged a lot, so I couldn't show a nice pretty slide with a bunch of pictures like I did the last time. So I just listed a few here, um, if anybody is taking notes or wanted to know. Uh, Bernard is pretty much the de facto dark nebula catalog. Uh, and I like this one here, because um, it's the E nebula. And you can kind of see the E there, although it looks more like a C to me. Uh, now some tips for observing these, uh, you're going to need a Decent sized telescope, probably about 10 inches or so um, plus to observe these. I like to look at them with a pretty wide field of view because the only way that you're seeing these is from the contrast and lack of stars. So if you can get a pretty wide field of view and then notice, hey, you know, this is the concentration of stars in the area. And then these are the regions that there aren't any stars. Let me go check out those regions. It would just increase the contrast and let you see more so that you can pick out these nebula easier. But these are pretty tricky. Uh, and there is an astronomical leaf um, club for, for observing club for these as well. And my party picture here, kind of bringing the whole thing together, is a uh, Bernard 139. This kind of dark area there, and this is a good example of how challenging these objects can be because if you're, if you're not really looking for them, you're not really going to notice too much that there's a dark nebula there. But also right by is NGC 6778, which is a uh, if you look at like higher resolution images of that, it's kind of like a little dumbbell nebula, which is pretty interesting. Uh, but here we have the two main uh, objects in Altair, um, or Kola, sorry, uh, right next to each other. So it's kind of neat. And uh, I, that's my last slide, so thank you. All right, thanks, Andrew. I'm gonna try to move this a little bit, get a little better views. John, you ready? Sure. All right, so now for our uh, main presentation of the evening, uh, we're delighted to have back uh, John Conrad, who's a NASA JPL Solar System uh, Ambassador. So John did his uh, work with uh, the Unmanned Spaceflight Program at the US Air Force and for NASA as well. And today he's gonna be telling us about a new mission coming up, which is the DART, uh, Double Asteroid Deflection Test. Let me... Uh, Slide show up here. Nope, oh, that's the wrong one. <coughs> alert, alert. All right. So secure, it won't let me do what I want. Enable external content. All right. Let's do that. Perfect. All right. So you, uh, you may or? Yeah. So you may recognize John. He's given us a few presentations before. He's talked about lunar science, he's talked mm -hmm. about Cassini. He's talked about rocket science 101. He's talked about global climate change, the view from space. And tonight he's going to be telling us about the double asteroid deflection test, which will be happening uh, later this fall. All right. So, John, take it away. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. As a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, you won't be able to hear it uh, on the YouTube. So please repeat any questions that uh, may come up. Okay. All right. So John talks a lot, I think, is basically what was just said there. <laughs> it is um, better than you can imagine to be back and see all you folks standing here in front of you. Um, I have talked to you a number of times in the last year and a half, I think, but uh, all Zooming. And so the last time that I was here in person, this is what was outside. It was... Is this not going to work? Oh, I just have to diddle it to let it know that we're on that. Okay, I didn't know how to diddle it. Okay. Uh, two and a half years ago, um, or 
if you um, know your uh, lunar month, 29.53 days, it was on Wednesday exactly 31 moons ago. So many moons ago, I was here. Uh, a very memorable, very memorable night for me. Uh, and here we go. I now call that the ambassador moon, which immodestly I will say I named after myself, because a lot of you may know that it was not only the last time I was standing here, but about two minutes after I walked out of the room, it was the last time I was standing period for about two months. I broke my ankle on the way to my car. So I uh, will always remember you guys. <laughs> and I will always remember this place. So I'm glad to be back. And I must say to the folks that are on YouTube, hello to you also. Um, hope to see you all again. So let's get on with it. So much for the nostalgia. And we'll start right off with a couple of famous astronomers in the front row there. And I'm going to guess that a lot of you saw this movie. Uh, and of course, the famous astronomers are famous astronomer actors. And the famous president, who um, didn't necessarily resemble anybody, was Meryl Streep there, except for the fact that she was the president that decided that not enough people cared about science. So she could just tell the population, don't look up when there was a dangerous NEO, near Earth object coming. Uh, and no matter how much uh, the astronomers hollered and pointed, they didn't look up, which I must say, seven, eight years ago, I would have thought was too improbable. But um, somehow today, um, with the attitude towards science, it sadly uh, wasn't just funny, it was a little bit scary. So tonight, we're going to look up. And the whole point of this talk is to talk about how we are looking up at near Earth objects at an asteroid like this, with a spacecraft known as DART, which is the double asteroid um, redirection test. And it is a planetary defense mission. And we'll talk about what that office is and what their mission is, and a little bit about the threat. But mostly we're going to talk about what DART is about to do, because it's been launched, it's on its way, and pretty soon we're going to have quite a special event. Uh, Tarek Daly, I have to give a lot of credit to. He's one of the instrument scientists for DART. Uh, he gave these slides to us and a really good talk. And so I'm going to be using a lot of his material. And I wanted to just point out that this is a, um, an asteroid built by APL, Applied Physics Lab, which I don't know if a lot of you are aware of. Uh, they're not quite as well known as JPL but they have built a lot of spacecraft through the years. <clears throat> in particular, on a personal note, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, I used to be involved in the unmanned programs. Uh, I actually launched an APL satellite uh -huh. 54 years ago, at 68, from Vandenberg. Uh, and DART launched about half an hour from that site um, in November. And so, the APL satellite that I launched was a very small one. It was in the first 10 years of the space age. We had about a dozen of these stacked above the upper stage in a unique configuration of an Atlas and a Burner 2. And they all did great in coming off of the um, being deployed, except for the fact that the fairing never separated. And so we had a whole bunch of satellites inside the fairing going into the South Pacific about 20 minutes after launch. It was um, not one of the greatest days for the Air Force or for APL, but um, that's the kind of stuff that made life exciting in the first decade. So here we are today and APL uh, has had a number of successful successes like New Horizons and this particular one, uh, I wanna give credit not just to them, but also to JPL who played a major role in it a whole bunch of NASA centers there in the upper left. And you're probably aware that JPL is not a NASA center. It's a contractor like APL is. And the centers, of course, have government employees. And then there are quite a number of national lab and um, universities and commercial companies that are also involved. 
<clears throat> the um, programs all fall under this brand new umbrella that I've talked about in my NEO talk, where we actually have a planetary defense officer reporting to the head of NASA, who's the senior official in the US for defending our planet. And they have quite a few functions that they perform. And in the last 10 years or so, all the major agencies around the world have set up one of these planetary defense programs. And one of the functions they perform, or I should say all the functions that are up here, they're trying to coordinate on. So let's just kind of look at what's up here quickly. In the center of the top is the place that keeps the information about all of these NEOs, the near Earth objects, especially what they call PHAs, potentially hazardous asteroids. So those are the ones, um, they all are the ones, and we have now more than 500,000 of them in the inventory at the Minor Planet Center, where they not only name them or number them and keep track of them, but they update their orbital elements on a regular basis because perturbations can happen. And even though what they're doing with their computers is projecting the orbits of these and everything like Earth goes around the sun, if it's not a moon, and so the orbits are on the order of a year to maybe two years, depending on what the cycle is, but they all pass across Earth's orbit. And what we're watching for as we look out literally decades into the future is any that are gonna happen to cross at the same time Earth crosses there and have a potential collision. And so far so good, nothing of any hazardous size is projected with any, um, you know, specifically, uh, any any probability above maybe 1%, even decades out. So we'll keep an eye on all these and the count is going up all the time. The upper right there is all of the surveillance uh, telescopes, most of them on the ground, most of them doing what are called surveys. Well, they cover the whole sky over and over again, looking, putting things into the minor planet center inventory. And then you come around clockwise and you find that we not only want to understand that these very dark, hard to see objects are there, but we'd like to know a bit more information about their size, obviously, but also about their shape, if possible, and some of their composition. So um, NEOWISE is a spacecraft that's addressing that, and um, Goldstone with a radio telescope and the infrared telescope are giving us some composition and shape information. So finally, down at the bottom there, you get to the point that with all these planetary defense offices, you've got exercises and conferences now that are done on a fairly regular basis. Um, the only thing they can do in terms of coordination exercise has to do with civil defense kind of things, where if something is going to be dangerous, then we can coordinate with each other, at least in information providing, if not in, um, you know, executing some activities that are planned. So those, uh, they have working groups, they have conferences. And then fortunately, we are looking ahead and saying, how can we deal with a potential threat if indeed one is there by our calculations? How can we mitigate it? Which simply means, how can we keep that thing that's gonna hit us from staying on that course? How can we change its course? And so that's what, the whole planetary defense mitigation mission is. And the um, current DART mission is the first spacecraft that's actually been launched to address one of the techniques that's been thought about for mitigation known as kinetic impact, which is you know intuitively obvious. You hit something as hard as you can uh, and hopefully that kinetic energy, that momentum will change the momentum of the object you hit enough that you'll change its velocity vector and change its orbit. So we're gonna test that out. We'll get to that in a second. First, I wanted to remind you of the threat. Uh, when I talked about NEOs before, <clears throat> you may remember there was a picture at one point that was an animation showing you the growing number of the count as different surveillance systems came on board in roughly the last 30 years. And the count went up just astronomically or almost exponentially 
to get to over half a million, which it is now. And this is a different kind of a chart about the threat. I mean, that was one way to look. And what you see is that the count goes up by leaps and bounds all the time still. This shows you which of those near Earth objects have actually impacted us over a 33 year period from 88 to um, 21. And if you counted them, you'd probably find there in that 33 year period, they're probably about 10 a year on average. And the legend tells you simply that the smallest blue ones are the smallest part of the scale up to the big red one. And yet the scale is just the threshold above 0.1 kilotons. And since that's a fraction, you might think, oh, oh 0.1, but it's a tons 2,000, a kilotons 2 million. And so 0.1 of that is 200,000 pounds of high explosive. So each of these 300 plus in the last 33 years, roughly, has delivered that kind of an explosive energy when that fireball exploded, uh, or I think in some cases they actually hit the ground, perhaps um, in, the, in the water maybe. At any rate, the one that jumps out is the one that you may be familiar with. We've talked about that too. That's in the center of Russia at a place called Chelyabinsk. And so that one was very large, the largest of those over that period back to the 80s and was about a half a megaton equivalent explosion, which fortunately was about 20 or 30 meters, I'm sorry, kilometers in the air and also not over a population center. It did result even at tens of kilometers away in hundreds up to about 1500 casualties, mostly from the shock wave uh, breaking glass. And so it was pretty devastating for casualties uh, and by far the biggest thing in that time period. And yet all these others are pretty big too. And so they do happen a lot. Another way to look at what's in the inventory of the known um, threat is to kind of start at the right here and look at the very biggest ones that we count because <clears throat> there aren't many of them. And that's the 10 kilometer class. And the reason that we can estimate that there's one of these every 100 to 200 million years is because we actually have that data point. The dinosaur killer that you recall about 65 million years ago, <coughs> which as it says under the impact there was actually globally devastating and wiped out, you know, extincted many species at the time. And had we been alive, probably it would have been the end of our species too. So that's, uh, that's that particular large category. We have in the inventory four known um, 10K size, <coughs> excuse me, objects. <clears throat> and we believe that we have 100% of them accounted for uh, in terms of what's up there in near Earth space. And the reason that we feel confident in that estimate is for the simple reason that they're really big and not hard to find at all. Um, the next class down, we worry a bit more about. They're a kilometer and they're um, gonna have a devastating effect uh, if they do in fact ever get into a, um, an air burst or a ground impact situation. And while it's not estimated that they will cause worldwide casualties, it is estimated that given our uh, infrastructure <clears throat> that, uh, thank you very much. Much appreciated. <clears throat> it's estimated that um, it would cause so much devastation much like a very, very large um, CME, coronal mass ejection, to our uh, technological infrastructures and navigation and communications and information capabilities that it could very much lead to the collapse of civilizations, that size of a detonation. We think we've found 90% of them, but there, that's, that's kind of scary when you think that that means there's maybe another hundred up there that we haven't found yet. 
And so we're looking hard to fill in that gap. Uh, the next size down are still pretty dangerous. Um, 160 meter, we actually have some examples of things approaching that in our history. And in the uh, impact database, it's online for you to look at the couple hundred craters we found around the world relate to all three of those larger categories. There are only three that are in the category of the 10 kilometer, but there are quite a number in this 160 millimeter, or I'm sorry, <laughs> kilometer size. And as it says, they will cause, you know, major casualties, especially if they're over a population area. And the trouble with them is there are so many of them. And while we found, we think over 8,000 of them and put them in the inventory, we think there are at least that many more, uh, maybe 12,000 more that we haven't found yet. So we're looking hard for those. And then we get to the lower sizes, which uh, in the case of 25 meters are still pretty dangerous. And we've got a couple fairly recent examples of those. We estimate the frequency to be about one every century. Uh, there was one we've talked about in um, Siberia, fortunately in an area that had almost no people and lots of trees that got blown down um, in the early 20th century. And uh, it, it was so sparsely populated and unknown uh, that it wasn't actually witnessed by people except some of the uh, indigenous there. And when they actually went to study it about two decades later, it was just getting sort of some folklore and counting trees blown down and identifying ground zero. But they did were able to estimate the size of it. And it was pretty devastating in terms of the impact. And had there been people there, it would have been quite devastating. And that once a century got tested, when we had the Chelyabinsk almost a century later, uh, just what, nine years ago now. And so it was a little smaller, but it could have been uh, much worse if it had actually been over a, a major urban area. And so then there, there's no crater from Tunguska, right? No crater? They did not, they were not able to identify one. The scientific expedition got there in 1932, I think. So by that time, they really had trouble, you know, finding physical evidence of it other than the trees lying on the ground. Um, the, uh, the last one I'll just note here is kind of in between those lower two categories. And any of you that have traveled to Arizona might have had a chance to look at the Behringer meteor uh, and the meteor crater there in Eastern Arizona. Uh, it's well identified by signs on the interstate. It's only a few miles off, and it's a great thing to go visit and look at into this uh, very large crater, very deep crater, and maybe buy something from the souvenir shop or the snack bar, too. So it's kind of a, an American way of, of seeing what a NEO can do. Now, it was a metallic asteroid that hit at a particularly steep angle, which is really um, devastating. And... The rings here show you that the fireball actually had an impact out to about six miles. So nothing would have survived. Nothing living would have survived in that. And out to about 15 miles, you would have had lots and lots of uh, fatalities and many more casualties. And hurricane force winds out to about uh, 25 miles, which probably takes you into New Mexico at that point. At any rate, that's interesting. It was an area um, prehistory, so you can't think about its impact on humans so much. But if you put the same scale over a met metropolitan area, then what you get is this. Um, if it happened to have ground zero in the middle of District of Columbia, then the fireball would essentially kill everybody in the district. And we won't pause and think about whether that's good or bad, but just <laughs> move move on to the fact that the into well into the Maryland and Virginia suburbs, you'd also have lots and lots of devastation and hurricane force winds all the way out to the Chesapeake Bay. So these things, and that's a that's a 50 meter um, impact. And we've um, not find, found by any means most of those. There are lots and lots of those up there that haven't yet been uh, identified and, and uh, tracked. <clears throat> now we're going to pause for a minute from 
thinking about the threat and thinking about what to do about the threat. So if you look at this um, graph on the right, the y-axis is the same scale that went left to right with the um, sizes there from uh, 20 meter diameter up through uh, one kilometer there in about the middle of the chart up to the dinosaur killer, the 10K at the top. And so these are the general categories that have been studied now for a couple decades of what we do about stopping one of these or moving one of these off of its path if it comes to that. And one of the bad news things on this slide is for all those roughly uh, one kilometer and above, um, there really isn't any technique uh, in terms of delivering enough energy to change things other than nuclear that we know of. And there are, as we said, 900 known at this point, and at least another 100 that we're likely to find. And so there are quite a few of them. Um, and nuclear isn't necessarily good uh, in that it's uncertain as to whether you will just exchange one huge devastating impact for several, uh, maybe half a dozen <clears throat> large pieces that will also have an impact on Earth. So we may end up just multiplying the problem uh, rather than having it go away. So in the area that you can, we hopefully are gonna learn to do things about, between about a hundred meters and one kilometer there, the two techniques are quite different. The tractor we talked about very briefly before, it's basically um, to send a large spacecraft, uh, maybe more, I don't know, out and park it literally right next to the potential uh, dangerous object, which you've protected, projected to have a time of at least a decade or two before it's gonna go around and it's eventually going to have a collision with the earth. And so you park a tractor next to it and the mutual gravitational attraction over a period of years is enough to pull it slightly off of its trajectory, change its uh, velocity vector just enough to miss the earth. That's the idea. Certainly theoretically it can work. It'll take a long time. And as you see from the fact that it occupies the long forecast period there of 20 years plus on the x-axis, uh, it doesn't fit everything. If you've got things that you project to come in closer than 20 years, and they're bigger than 100 meters, then you want to have a technique, and that's where we fill it in with kinetic impact. And we haven't done it yet. Um, and so the whole idea that was addressed by the National Academy of Sciences a little over a decade ago was to recommend that that be the first area that we do an actual uh, test of. And so NASA picked that up. They got the program funded, hired APL, and now DART is going to test the 160 meter size asteroid with a kinetic impact coming very soon. And now we're gonna get to that. So here's the target. And we don't have time to go into how they chose it, but as you can imagine, it's an identified asteroid in near-Earth space that we can get enough information about to know what the, um, what the impact of our impact was or what the result of our impact was to learn things about kinetic impact. It is, in fact, a double asteroid system. You folks are familiar with binaries. And so the big brother uh, is Didymos, which is, in fact, very big. Um, and we aren't certainly going to try to hit that. That's in the category of uh, global devastation. What we wanna find out is what we can do with kinetic impact in this hundred to a few hundred meter range. And so the little moonlet uh, orbiting Didymos is Dimorphos at about 160 meters. And so that is our target. And just to give you a feeling for the scale, uh, the largest dimension of Didymos is taller than the World Trade Center and approaching the largest skyscraper uh, and by far more massive than either one of those. And even Dimorphos, 
is um, in its linear dimension bigger than the Statue of Liberty. And as far as its massiveness, it's about like the Great Pyramid, picture it like that. So it looks small because it's sitting next to its big one, but it's very big. Another way to visualize it, I picked up, I really like this one. Huh. Um, there it is hovering over the Colosseum, if you've ever been there. So it's not small at all. And it'll have a target on it. It does right now. And what we're gonna hit it with is the DART spacecraft. So this gives you a feeling for just how big DART is not. Okay, there's a dimension of it. Uh, it's taller or it's longer than a school bus is long, uh, shorter than the Arc de Triomphe. And as you'll see, most of the mass is right in the center when we take a look at it. But it, it is what it is and we've gotten it up there and it's on its way. And its target is that uh, fixed object that the uh, very large telescope in Chile is imaging here as the stars pass by, uh, as the earth rotates. And so there we have the best pictures that we have. Now, many ground-based telescopes have taken pictures of it, but at its size of whatever it was, um, 700 meters, something like that, uh, it's not large enough. And the two are so close together that they certainly can't be resolved. And we haven't even got a good optical image of it. The thing on the right there is what we think it might look like, but that's not an optical image. That's a radar. Um, it's based on radar data and it's based on the light curve data that you'll see how we use that in a minute in order to establish the uh, period of the smaller object around the larger object. So it's roughly that kind of a shape, we think. And as we approach it soon, we will finally get some up close images of it. So that is the target, Didymos, the moonlet. Uh, there's what we know about it in between the two question marks there. Um, we certainly haven't seen it yet, but from the light curve data, we know it's there just like we know the exoplanets are there. And we've been able to estimate its dimension and we've picked a number of um, examples of that size range of different asteroids there. And so we've come up with this as our guess for what Dimorphos is. And coming in September, we will actually be watching as we find out what it really looks like. But I wouldn't be surprised if NASA does their um, media coverage the way they seem to be doing these days. If you don't start to see the picture of Dimorphos there and have people thinking of it that way, even though we have no idea what it really looks like at this point. But that's our target. So um, I thought at this point, it might be useful just to show you a, a video starting with a launch, which took place at the, re at the opening of the window uh, from Vandenberg, which you note now is not an Air Force base, it's a Space Force base now, um, uh, on a launch site uh, just you know, a few hundred yards from the Pacific Ocean uh, at the end of November. And so here it is being launched on a, um, any minute, there we go. Being launched on a Falcon 9, uh, coming off the top of the second stage and unrolling uh, about Let's see, about, um, I think about 30 feet of solar panels in both directions, uncovering the very important uh, camera telescope as it approaches this system, which is coming around in its two-year orbit to be right close to Earth. And just before, 10 days before impact, a, um, a CubeSat will be launched to take pictures right after impact. So we get a look at the crater initially. Uh, and here is an animation of how it guides itself in. We'll see a bit more about that in a minute. And so that's a, a good, um, you know, artist video of the whole thing. So here's another way to look at the system. Uh, it kind of looks like 
two objects there, but that's actually dimorphos as a bi bilobe kind of object that we picked. Orbiting Didymos, a uh, little less than 12 hours period. Uh, and that was the period today. Now DART will come in, the Lichia cube CubeSat will be deployed, the impact will take place, and the CubeSat will take some pictures. So that's the essence of the mission right there. And the first and very important measurement to be taken is to see how much we changed the momentum of the target object. Uh, if we changed it uh, as much as we expect, it could be um, many minutes shorter uh, than it was before. And so the same technique that's been used to uh, use the light curve to estimate the current uh, estimate very precisely the current period will be used right after this. And so we'll get a chance to see that we did act, in fact have a measurable influence with our impact. So the first requirement, uh, which hopefully will be met at the end of September, uh, probably right at the beginning of the window, there's a several day window, will be on September 26th. Uh, and the next two things have to do with what I just said, changing the orbital period, and measuring that period from ground-based uh, telescopes. And then finally over here, the fourth requirement is to calculate something that's extremely important. This has a lot to do, a lot more to do with actually how effective any kind of kinetic impact is gonna have on an object because we don't understand that much about these small uh, solar system objects in terms of how dense they are how hard the surface is. We only have a few examples so far. This is a model of what we call a rubble pile asteroid. And we believe all of these, including even Didymos, are rubble piles. Basically, very small um, rocks, including some dust up to much larger rocks and some boulders maybe, all held together by their own gravity, which is to say that the smaller they are, the smaller the amount of gravity holding them together is. And so this is a NASA model of a crater being formed by an impact where the impactor excavates material in the opposite direction. And just like uh, Newton with his third law tells us that there's an equal and opposite reaction, the ejecta will actually increase the velocity change in the other direction. So part of the oomph that we're gonna get from hitting it isn't just from hitting it like a billiard ball would hit a ball, pool ball in a uh, an elastic collision of two hard objects. It's going to be to eject a bunch of material. And so that measurement of beta is very key. So now let's, let's look at that period of dimorphos. And you're familiar with these light curves, I think. Um, very uh, accurate measurements of the sum of the light from the two objects and then the change in that, the decrease as the object passes in front of or behind, and the ability to time this and use repeated observations to get more and more precise estimates of the um, period. And today the period is something like 11 hours, 53 minutes and some. And they, uh, you see the, the reason why it's kind of offset there as it goes behind is because the telescopes shown on the earth over here to the right. And in fact, all of these telescopes have actually imaged and measured, uh, estimated the period. So it's been done a number of times now. And my guess is if you went to any of these um, in the middle of September, you'd find that they're all signing up for a pool to see who in the competition will measure an accurate period change first. And so I'm really excited to see what they come up with, but they'll all be trying to figure it out. So that beta that I mentioned, um, just to show you in one example here on the left, um, if the impact hits a surface that has no crater formed and no ejecta, then that's a beta of one. The beta is sort of the additive part in addition to the momentum where MV, the mass times the velocity for a very small mass with a very high velocity is hitting a very large mass with a small velocity in this case. So you get some momentum change, but beta 
is the extra momentum change. And we expect something more like cases uh, middle and right there, where if you get some ejecta, you get a higher beta. And if you get a lot of ejecta and a big crater, then you should get quite a bit of extra impulse, extra push from the ejecta. <clears throat> so we'll see. Um, again, uh, they like to model things. And so this just gives you an example with their rubble pile model of all these different sizes and shapes of the crater being formed and the excavated material being ejected out. Now, I kind of went away from the presentation we were given to look into something that just had a study announced last month, and that was the asteroid Bennu. And some of you may remember this in the news, maybe a year and a half ago, a NASA spacecraft craft called OSIRIS-REx visited Bennu. Um, here's how big it is. So it's in between Dimorphos and Didymos. And it's in between as in quite a bit bigger than the target that we have. Okay, try that again. And 25 times more massive than Dimorphos and much higher gravity because that's what's holding the whole thing together. And so we actually did visit it in October of 2020. They rendezvoused, they orbited, they picked a spot to touch down and they did an event called a tag, touch and go. And I'll give you a look at that in just a minute. But my point in looking at this and comparing it is that's a much larger object that we just learned something about by literally going down and hitting the surface and learning something about the surface layer with quite a bit higher gravity than Dimorphos has. So let's look at what they found. There's a picture of the spacecraft as it was going down with its foot called Tag Sam. Uh, it's a sampling. Uh, technique with a touch and go. They didn't collide. They literally came to the surface at the velocity of an insect walking is the way they describe it. And when they sat, pushed down on the surface, they blew a puff of, of uh, gaseous nitrogen, a large amount of it, that caused the material not only to excavate a crater underneath them, but to blow the material up in the air, and you'll see that in the video in a second, and collect the material, which has then been put into a re-entry vehicle that's on its way back to Earth, and it'll arrive next year so we can actually study the material. They've got about half a pound of it. But the big surprise, and this is why they just had, even though this was all done in 2020, a study just came out in June and was in Nature, and and uh, I saw it on space.com um, that shows that the, they revisited it after the initial mission, uh, again, went back and got better pictures of the crater. And they have found that the depth and size of the volume of the crater is much bigger than they expected. Uh, the composition of the surface, they believe, is quite a bit different than they expected. So um, I'm going to see if we can um, get this video to run here. Let me give it a try. One of Earth's closest neighbors is a dark, jumbled mass of rocks and boulders known as asteroid Bennu. Bennu is ancient, a rugged survivor of the solar system's chaotic past that may hold clues to the origins of life. In October 2020, a NASA spacecraft called Osiris Rex touched down on Bennu and collected a sample for return to Earth. Scientists had expected that this touch-and-go event, or TAG, would have little impact on the asteroid. After a slow descent, the sampler head would briefly make contact, inject a pump of gas, and capture a handful of material. Perhaps it would also leave a small divot at the sample site, a subtle footprint in the soil, or so it was thought. So that was just an artist concept. Event, Here are the real Earth, images. Far more dramatic than anticipated. Despite its slow touchdown, Osiris Rex punched through the surface and set off an explosion of loose material. Tons of rocks and pebbles were ejected, radiating outward in a wall of debris. The, the, me the crater is like eight meters the wide. The surface behaved so unexpectedly. The answer involves cohesion, an attractive force that can bind molecules together. 
cohesion gives water its surface tension and keeps droplets together even in a microgravity environment like the International Space Station. Granular materials like wheat flour, cocoa, and dust can also exhibit cohesion, which pulls individual grains into clumps. On Bennu, scientists had expected cohesion to act like a bit of glue between the rocks, making its loose surface more solid. But the tag event showed that Bennu's uppermost layers are nearly cohesionless, deforming under stress like a fluid. A good analogy is a ball pit. Although the plastic balls are solid, they easily slide past one another and past boisterous children, behaving in mass like a fluid. Thanks to OSIRIS-REx, we now know that Bennu's surface is not held together by cohesion, but by gravity, or microgravity, with a minute tug less than 100,000th the pull of Earth. On the moon, gravity is 16% the strongest it is on Earth, how do I stop and this? more than 16,000 times stronger than it is on Bennu. As a result, loose material in the lunar subsurface is packed together I really tightly. Just, okay. Surface relative. Okay. Um, that's okay. Earth's closest neighbors is a dark, jumbled mass of rocks and boulders. No. Here we go. Okay. Um, what I wanted to emphasize here, you may have already gotten it, but it's quite simply this. With the microgravity of Bennu, remember being 25 times more massive than the target we're about to hit, the surface was so loosely packed that it, it behaved like a fluid, is the word that they use. And so the model that we saw before um, that APL has shown us of what might be a beta from some excavation of a material, um, I'm eager to see what happens because it looks to me like with this sort of surface, you're more likely to get the, the effect of a crumple zone on a car where much of the energy is simply dissipated in the surface and in moving around things that aren't really being held together by much. And I'll be very interested to see what we learn about how much actual extra momentum transfer we get from this. All right, so let's see. So here is the spacecraft. On the left there, um, you see one view of it, um, about eight to nine feet tall, uh, very simplified views, uh, the things that matter, that telescope uh, that's gonna be used to find it and then guide the, um, the, the um, impactor in. Uh, the CubeSat that is going to be deployed from the side there. If you flip it 180 degrees for the middle picture, you see that you guide it with a combination of software uh, and the telescope's images and these hydrazine thrusters that you'll see a simulation of in just a minute. And the other key component I wanted to point out was that high gain antenna. So that we're going to get to witness this thing in real time as it moves in. Yes. What's its main propulsion system? Is ion thrusters? Uh, that wasn't its main propulsion system, but yes, you were right. That's that is what that video showed. Yeah, there was an ion system that was used. But you don't get a lot of thrust. No, you don't, and you only use that when you're in space with a lot of time available yeah. to get somewhere. And in this case, since we just launched it in November, we didn't have a lot of time to get anywhere. So they're just kind of testing out that ion system on this vehicle, but that isn't the main, the main. Uh, so the hydrogen you make them? Yes. Is yes. that a mono? Or um, that's a good question, and I don't know. Um, so the big dimension uh, that has little to do with the mass is unrolled solar panels. You can see there, so it's sixty feet long, uh, thirty feet each, and with the mass all concentrated in the middle. To give you a better idea of the size, uh, here it is. Um, and you see in the upper left there, it's about 1,500 pounds, uh, which is about the size of a smart car. So picture a smart car uh, with wings. Um, and uh, that's kind of the idea. Or you can picture uh, Shaquille O'Neal standing on the ground next to it and putting his palm on the top of it. That's how tall it is. And now I'm going to always have a picture of about four or five Shaquille O'Neal's impacting the asteroid. But at any rate, <laughs> that's what's coming with DART. All right. So the other main performer there, uh, 
a spacecraft in itself is built by the Italian Space Agency uh, named, named Lichia Cube. And I like to show the size of these uh, standard um, cube sets because you may know the one U is well defined as about the size of a Kleenex box, okay, about four by four by four. So if you stack three of them next to each other and another row on top, that's about how big Lichia Cube is with its um, solar panel wings there for power and its two um, uh, nicely named uh, cameras there. I guess the Italians like Star Wars. At any rate, um, what I do note here is that not only will it be deployed early, about 10 days before um, the impact, but it's timed such that it will uh, take the pictures about three minutes after impact from up close, but the best resolution they're going to have is two meters per pixel. Well, I mean, two meter resolution to look at ejecta on the surface and things like that uh, is going to be lucky to tell us very much. Now, I'm eager to see it, but um, we don't get as much uh, primary data about what happened to the asteroid from this camera as I wish we would, but you'll see that we've taken care of that a different way. So here in fact is how the operation will go. Uh, that Draco camera has an acronym uh, there, Didymos Reconnaissance and Asteroid Camera for OPNAV. And what I thought you folks would be more interested in is it's about an eight inch aperture. Um, and that's what we have uh, to give us the best possible images to find and then keep an eye on literally uh, the target as we move in. And so here is the sequence of events. Late August, about 30 days beforehand is the first we expect the Draco telescope to be able to identify the Didymo system. And it'll be at that point that we actually start to get some images and see what it is that we've guessed about the larger body and what its shape actually is, but it'll be quite a ways after that before we can see the smaller body. Uh, about three weeks later, they'll have the ground or the coverage uh, for the high gain antenna there on continuously for the last 10 days. So we'll get to keep an eye literally on what it's seeing all the time. And then in the last day, we get down to the last four hours and they enable the smart nav guidance system. And you'll see a simulation of that in a second. So clearly you wanna tie the imagery together with the control thrust control mechanism, the hydrogen thrusters with some uh, very good software, which is the smart nav system. And so that gets going four hours beforehand. And in the last hour, I think it's kind of interesting to see that it's going to be about 15,000 miles away. And so that's an hour. And so you now know that the relative velocity of the impact will be 15,000 miles an hour when it hits. The, um, the time is coincidentally or not correlated to the resolution of um, Draco in that it's the first time they believe they'll actually be able to fully resolve with more than one pixel of that little moonlet that is the target, Dimorphos. So at this point, we hone in on it and we get, um, as you can see from the inset, the yellow there in the center, that's the actual data that will be telegraphed or will be um, telemetered down to earth that we'll be able to see. And you see the hydrazine thrusters firing and they keep the, the double asteroid system centered. And we've got um, a simulation of the last hour here, uh, speeded up at 30 times. Uh, but even at that, I'd like to go ahead if I can get it moving here. Let me see. I'd like to get down toward the end. No. Yeah, here we go. So now we're um, still with a fast animation. Uh, hard to read the numbers. No, that's still 54 minutes, isn't it? You know what I'm gonna do? 
is one of those times where you wish you were using your own computer. I don't, I'm not going to try it. Never mind. It'll, it'll be over. It's going to take about two minutes. I just want to take it out of um, slideshow mode for the moment. We'll lose it on the main screen, though. That's all right. Yeah, I can't do that. that. That's what I've been trying to do. Okay. Can't. Yeah. All right. Well, if this were, uh, if that were working the way I wanted it to, you'd see the screen eventually fill up as it centers it and impacts it. And then we'll get a chance to see up close what it actually looks like as the uh, spacecraft goes in for the impact here and hopefully uh, kicks off a lot of ejecta and leaves the crater for the Lychia cube to take a look at, uh, even though its resolution is only eight, uh, roughly, uh, what did it say, two meters per pixel. All right, so now I'm going to tell you why things aren't quite as bad as that, and I should maybe say it in such a negative way, but I was hoping for better resolution. The mission is actually an international mission known as AIDA, which you see the long name for up there, and it's done jointly with our European Space Agency partners. So the first part of it is in fact the impact by DART, and the second part of it is a European Space Agency mission that's going to do a much better job of actually um, reconnoitering the, um, the site. It's not going to launch until about two years after the impact. It's, of course, headed for the same target, Dimorphos. It's going to get there and not impact it, but rendezvous with it in 2026. And it's going to do a crime or crash scene investigation and do a much better job of measuring the mass and the details of the crater and the ejecta. And the way it does it is with um, thermal imagers, optical imaging, um, LIDAR, which is great uh, as you move around to actually see the shape uh, and the topography of things, and some CubeSats. And they're still deciding how many to have that will go down at least close to the surface to take their measurements and may, in fact, land on the surface. So the best of the data that's going to come out of it in terms of what the actual impact caused on this particular kind of a surface isn't going to come until 2026, unfortunately. Uh, but that is the way it is. It's a coordination of two planetary defense programs. And so we'll get some good information uh, this September and better information, hopefully, a bit after that. Hey, John. Yeah. Did you tell us this already, but how far is the target from the Earth and what's the speed right now? Um, the target, uh, let's see, the, the dual asteroid system has a two year period and it, mm -hmm. you know, crosses Earth's orbit. So mm -hmm. you, you, can, you can calculate the speed. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the, and the distance is, was selected so that we could have a launch that would have it arrive when it was at its closest approach to Earth. And I don't know what that is. Okay, sorry, it's a good question. I, the answer is I don't know. John? Yes. On uh, YouTube Power of the Cold and the Gasoline, the lack of cohesion on the menu, is it possible that on the smaller target that it may well just be uh, that? The, 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 the impact will be just uh, absorbed into the, the mass of the, uh, the object and have no effect? Um, nobody in our <clears throat> nobody in our ambassador group was so bold as to ask that question of the, <laughs> the scientist who just spent years <laughs> preparing for this. Um, but I say that um, I actually didn't think to ask the question. I just got this data about then about yeah. two weeks ago yeah. and just added it in. The information we got from them came about four months ago, um, which was about three months after launch. I think. Um, I imagine 
I mean, they're all one small tight knit community. So um, this is going to be the first data point for a particular mitigation technique. And they are all eager to learn about 160 meter class yeah. uh, potentially hazardous asteroids as to whether or not we're gonna have much impact on them at all, unless we can get a spacecraft up there that's you know many tons, let's say. Um, but they're gonna learn a lot about the surface from this thing. And I'm afraid that what we just read about Bennu that was just published is a bit, um, a bit scary in terms of how much energy absorption there's gonna be in that surface area, as opposed to just Maybe you need to go into translating. <laughs> yeah. The um, so Didn't I'm not quite that in space balls, <laughs> giant vacuum cleaner. <laughs> so I'm going to finish up here with, with a famous rock group that you probably recognize. There's Queen, and some of you may even know why I've got it up there, because um, this guy, um, Brian May, is their lead guitarist, and you may or may not know that he's also a famous astrophysicist, very involved in the Neo program. And the reason I'm showing you this is he's um, the narrator uh, looking like a you know, century old English barrister here or something as he looks today, um, narrating a really great video about the European Space Agency's program. So I've provided um, this slide uh, among two to uh, Jeremy so he can circulate them. So you don't need to write down that website. If you want to look at this video, I really recommend it. And then finally, the other slide that Jeremy is going to have for you, uh, since you guys love to do, um, not necessarily looking through the eyepiece, which is suggested by the Minor Planet Center here, won't be very um, satisfying. But with some astrophotography, uh, you may get a chance to actually see it uh, in the window of impact down there. Uh, it's very much at the southern end of Eridanus, um, kind of below Orion and Lepus and to the right of Columba there. So it's very in, very much in the south. But that's where it'll be on September 26th and for a few days after that, if you want to try to get a picture. And nobody's suggesting you're going to see the impact, just if you want to get your own look at uh, this dual asteroid system. So thanks very much. More questions? Go ahead. Um, so the, the Draco system, is that going to be, is that a, uh, uh, the Draco system, is that a visible camera or is that uh, something else that you can Nobody asked and I didn't, so I don't know. Okay. And I haven't seen the specs on it. All I found in the specs was that little bit that I showed you there about its aperture and everything. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering, is it just visible when the last of the it's just going to be illuminated to see it um, from someone. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, I I have to assume with all the planning that goes on with these things that folks are are planning that in, uh, or that they've got a thermal capability. Um, you know, so that you know, having once done some research into the infrared signature in, in the Nevada test site from nuclear detonations and the changes in the surface layer, I know that it's much better to have some thermal IR for that. Yeah. So um, I don't know. It's a good question. Anybody else? Thanks again. Nice presentation. Um, I know, and I know you mentioned it, but what was the velocity of the darts when it hit the... the uh, 15,000 miles an hour. 15,000 miles an hour. And, and the mass of the mass of what, dimorphos? No, darts. Darts is, is uh, 1,500 pounds. Yeah, not very big. Thanks. A smart car hitting um, the, uh, the, the Great Pyramid, the Great Pyramid in Egypt, yeah. Um, and I don't think- A smart think... car going very fast. <laughs> that's, that's, it. that's the key. Uh, and hopefully not having all those plastic balls spread readily. Um, the um, um, nothing. It's interesting that you mentioned that the injector will actually fall back on it and 
further the momentum of the it's not by falling back that it furthers it it's just you know a rocket engine sits here and the rocket equation basically says how fast can i exit how much mass in the direction other than where i want to go so that's the action and that's the reaction and in this case the action is all that material going one way which is back toward where the the impactor came from and the reaction is pushing giving some added velocity to the body that's beta. Question. Realistically, how big an impact would you need to be an effective planetary defense weapon? Um, I'm not smart enough to answer. It's early days. Obviously, this is the first actual empirical data we're going to get from trying to do something and, and seeing it with enough detail. To see what I mean, it's got it's it's all about the surface layer and the composition, um, not just the concentration, but the composition of the object that you're hitting. And we do not understand small solar system bodies very well. Yes, sir. Has anyone looked into the effect of the gravity produced by the by Dynamos? on the results of your experiment. In other words, the most itself has a certain amount of mass that's holding uh, the little guy in orbit. So some of the, uh, the, the, the that gravitational field, those effects are going to influence the actual results and make it different from the case where you're just hitting that smaller asteroid by itself. Um, all I can say is my gut feel is that that's very much a higher order effect. Um, I don't think it would have much effect on it personally. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Maybe I have one. Okay. How transferable do they think these results are? Because maybe you know some asteroids have different compositions, so you know is this one picked out for being really average, or do we think this one might be better or worse? Because I think you know it could be like a rock. You know, you can kick a rock and you can send it, or you kick a pile of dirt and it doesn't really go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So you know, how strongly cohesive are they, and you know how heterogeneous is this class of objects? Yeah, I mean the example that I keep coming up with, I think that through is you know simple pool table. And you want to put the eight ball in the side pocket, and you get an almost perfectly elastic uh, transfer of momentum from the cue ball. Uh, and so the rest velocity of the eight ball becomes almost the same as the velocity of the cue ball that hit it. Now, if you happen to make, you know, have a trick set of pool balls, you know, to entertain your friends with at the bar or something, you might make one of them out of something that looks like it's solid, but it's made out of clay. And um, and watch as the front half of that just powders, pulverizes, you know. It could be more like that, I'm afraid. Um, looking at what they have found on Bennu now, uh, that mass, I mean, that was tons of very small, um, material that literally got ejected over, you know, a 25 foot radius from just that single touchdown and blowing the nitrogen out there. Uh, and it made a much deeper uh, crater than they expected, but it spread this material all around. And I think, you know, much like a crumple zone in a car, uh, it, it probably kept most of the asteroid from feeling much of anything. But of course, you don't care if the asteroid feels it as long as it changes its momentum. They, I think they've kind of put the whole group of ambassadors into the situation of we can kind of all think this through. You know, we throw a bowling ball down and hit a pin and watch as, you know, the ball slows down and the pins pick up the velocity where they're just sitting there. We can all picture these collisions. And the big mystery is beta. Um, the big mystery is just, and that's, and beta is a function 
of the surface layer uh, density and cohesion and what lies underneath it. And we can all understand for the uncountable number of asteroids of this size that they aren't all gonna be alike. But the sooner we start getting some data points on what seems to change and we'll actually have an estimate from the change in the period of how much you know velocity change there was. As soon as we get some data points, we'll start to be able to guesstimate whether the mass, if it had been 10 times as much, would have caused this much of a change or something like that. But more and, and equally important, understand what the surface of these small uh, solar system bodies is like. Because um, while they may be lacking in cohesion like Bennu turned out to be, um, when that mass comes through the atmosphere and most of it hits the earth, um, that's devastating regardless of what the surface was like. John, uh, Lou Berman asked the question, is, is there anybody that's extrapolating how much energy we would end up needing to deflect something? I guess in, in the 10 meter, 100 meters envelope. I mean, it, we're obviously just doing an experiment to, to gain some initial knowledge, but do we have an end game? I, I would be very surprised if they don't have plenty of curves that have been debated and put into papers and that they're waiting for the first actual data points and that we've been talking about the coefficients like um, not you know, the properties and coefficients, um, density, uh, surface cohesion, things like that, to actually get some data points to start start to test their their um, equations and see if they can estimate these things or, or draw some curves, uh, do some scaling. Um, I imagine the debates are a lot of fun, actually, but um, we're going to learn a lot with this, I think. I just wish we had better resolution to see it initially instead of two meters per pixel. Uh, it's successful and you're able to change the orbital pattern, I guess, of Didymus. Does it also change dimorphous a little bit? No. No, not at all. No. no. Much bigger. No, yeah, much bigger. I mean, Bano you saw was 25 times bigger and dimorphous was another 200 meters, 300 meters in diameter bigger than Bennu. I imagine that um, the mass of uh, Didymos is at least a hundred times greater than uh, we could calculate it pretty easily. But at any rate, yeah, no, there's there's not expected to be any any appreciable change. No. And then in the future, like if there is a an asteroid and it's got our name on it, like we would need to approach it as early on because that way the smallest change in deflecting it equates to a much larger uh, degree of the, the, the more decades right. before the predicted impact right and the more of those decades we can have left after we've done something to try to change the velocity vector the more change there will be by the time that collision might have occurred Yes. Actually, Mitch's question brings up an interesting, uh, an interesting point about scaling, right? Because you look at the two objects, one is like, oh, it's 10 times bigger than the other, but it's 10 times bigger in one dimension, 10 times bigger in another dimension, and 10 times bigger in the third dimension, right? So that's cubic scaling. It's a thousand times more massive. And that's probably about it. I think the big one is probably about a thousand times more massive than the small one, a couple hundred. Yeah, it's certainly. Yeah, things get big real fast. They also found with Bennu, I just remembered this, I was going through the paper today, that the density of Bennu was about half of what they predicted. That's a very large asteroid. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> so I would suggest that it's very loosely. Packed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Dimorphos is a lot smaller. so. You know, I just don't know what they're going to find when they, they hit the thing. It should have good masses if it's an orbiting system. 
that's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah there's what, there's some angular momentum. It has to affect the orbit of the smaller object orbiting the larger. Would it be possible to affect that orbit so that it crashes into the? I mean, that's. Um, let's say we could. Um, the probability of that being the one that looks like it's going to be a problem is small. I mean, the double asteroid system with a much bigger and a much smaller, and it's the small one we think is going to hit us, even if we could do away with it by that technique. It's kind of an interesting thought, but you're not going to run into that very often at all. Also, you mentioned that you ran this, uh, and, and there were no, uh, for decades, there were no near uh, Miss objects. Uh, did your projection uh, say when there would, would be one? The um, potential. Uh, yeah, of course I didn't run it. I mean, I'm just telling you what NASA has, uh, and the the Minor Planet Center has it too. But the easiest way to look at this, and you can look at it anytime you want to. Do any of you look at the spaceweather.com mm -hmm. website? Okay, all the way at the bottom of that. Uh, at least the other day, they have all the the neos that um, that uh, are projected to show up in the next three months. Um, anytime you want to, there's a there's a real time changing list of the next few months near Earth objects and what their missed distance from uh, collision is in terms of lunar distances, a quarter of a million miles. So if you see four LD then that's about a million miles it's going to miss by. There are very few that are under four. Once in a while, there'll be one. Once in a while, there'll be one that's half, but that's still, you know, four times as far out as the uh, geostationary uh, spacecraft are. Um, so you watch, you watch that column to see. You also watch the size column, which is one of the other columns in this table that, again, changes in real time. Every day, the list is slightly changed. Okay, looking a few months out is the size. And so it's the estimated diameter. And so you find all these that are 12, 20, you know, six, maybe there's an 80. Um, maybe once in a while there's 780, or there's one that's one and a half kilometer. And so there are some pretty big ones that show up rarely. And you find a big one and you look over at the missed distance and you find that it's going to miss us by 4.3 million miles. Okay. So there's no combination projecting all of these hundreds of thousands of objects out for decades that is going to cross Earth's path at a point in time, anytime in decades. They haven't found one yet. They found a few that maybe 34 years out or something look like there's some percent of chance, uh, maybe 2% um, that it might become within an envelope of distances that would be worrisome. So they'll keep an eye on that and update it after a few years. How about centuries? Uh, well, you could do it. You can do any of these calculations as long as you want. They're kind of meaningless looking out, I would, I would suggest. I used to do orbital mechanics all the time. If you look out 100 years, there are almost certainly going to be some perturbations, you know, whether it's Umama or one of these minor planets or something that comes from another star system that comes through or, you know, just changes in, in uh, for whatever. There, there are different reasons. The... Um, trying to remember the name of it, there's an effect due to solar radiation or solar radiance. Basically, Pointing Robertson? Excuse me? Pointing Robertson? No, that's not the one. Sarkovsky effect, I think it's called. Um, and it basically is saying, and, and the choice that they made of um, dimorphos being a bilobe object of irregular shape and size, in that, in that case, if you picture an asteroid for many years sitting out there with solar wind hitting it, the different sizes of it will cause rotation because there's actually pressure from that solar wind. And so that can actually cause a perturbation sometimes, not just 
in the rotational period, but actually in the position of it and the velocity of it. So that's a kind of a perturbation that they look at that takes a long time, but nonetheless, it's there. And, but back to your main point, we haven't found anything yet that's in that catalog. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the website. Um, I'll send it to Jeremy, but uh, it's a NASA website, um, NEO something or other, CNS or something like that. And it has a headline, you know, it's got a pull down menu and there are headlines. So if anything is coming close, there'll be an article about it there, but it always has this list of um, potential uh, of nearby NEOs basically updated all the time and you'll know about it <laughs> within 24 hours if they ever find one that say is dangerous big enough to be dangerous and has any finite probability of hitting us within the next decade or something like that that'll be big news uh, so far nothing's even close to that Don't worry about my great 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 grandkids <laughs> and we all should be, in all seriousness, which is why investing in this mitigation program is really important, I think. I wonder if any of these, uh, you know, they have the surface, the gravelly surface, but I wonder if any of them have solid cores. I, am. I don't think that that's what they think. I think they, sure. you know, you picture the asteroid belt and all of the many planetesimals of various sizes in that. And slowly but surely through the first billion or two billion years, things close enough actually joined with each other. You remember the one object that we found out in the Kuiper belt and visited was a bilobe. Basically, it was a contact binary. It looked like probably it wasn't really held together, although it was touching. And so lots and lots of the bigger objects collect small objects uh, and the ones that didn't make planets like all those that are the asteroid belt, basically a failed planet, uh, just stay all those small pieces and they collect up with each other. But I think most of the collection has been done long in the past. And having said that, there are collisions every year. So things do happen. All right, any other questions? I just got a comment by text, uh, best presentation you've ever done. Oh my goodness. That's a pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty big compliment. Anything else on YouTube? No questions from the internet. You've silenced everyone on the internet. You've silenced the YouTube <laughs> comment section. Thank right, let's thank you. John whoever for... gave me, I want to give two thanks. One to whoever made that comment. That's very kind. The other thanks I want to give, I don't think he's in the room, but the gentleman in the pickup truck two and a half years ago when I had to holler for help down there that helped me. I don't think he's here tonight. I don't see him. I think but... that might've been Bill, younger guy. Yeah, Paul. yeah, right. Was and that, uh, Was that January, 2020? Yeah. Because you were the last speaker then before the pandemic. Yep, I was. As I say, luckily and, nothing and, else bad happened that and year. And my wife and I uh, got to enjoy being locked down for about a month and a half before the pandemic locked everybody else down. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's thank John for a really great talk. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, Howard Goldner says, don't look up. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's uh, switch over to the other camera for a minute. So everyone out there, you are on the internet. So I think this brings uh, the meeting to a close. So uh, we can say uh, goodbye to everyone uh, joining us on YouTube. And hopefully we'll see you next month at Fort Washington State Park. Thanks for attending.